What are you doing out in the snow? It's 32 degrees below zero Celsius. And my dad is working hard, looking beyond the extents of hypothermia, hypochondria, and all the elements combined, he works to build a fence. A true servant, a true worker, a true exhibit of hard work and ethics. This is my father in whom I am well pleased. Welcome back to another Bitcoin podcast interview. Today, we have your favorite Twitter personality, Texture, <laughs> coming on the show to uh, talk shop or trash or whatever we end up talking about. Uh, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, even though I don't like Bitcoin at all. It's fine. Neither do we. We just, we're just, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a get... name that is historically relevant because we started when there was only Bitcoin and then... We kept it because it's a good name. Yeah. Uh, Rub the podcast. To, we are moving to uh, eventually. So like this was this episode 394. So in yeah. six five episodes. or so, six episodes, we're moving everything over to hashing it out because it's a more reasonable brand name for what we talk about. Yeah. And then we could argue like aggressively. <laughs> we can argue aggressively now. Uh, probably not. I like. <laughs> I feel like. I feel like the like, the internet has gotten so obsessed with arguing that like, I kind of have toned it down because the internet doesn't need more arguing. <laughs> like I mean, that's Twitter. Twitter. Oh, I, the internet in general, but Twitter is a really good like, uh, like personification of where to go to bitch. Yeah, and I just feel like I was kind of uh, a pioneer in bitching as much as possible on Twitter. And then when it caught on, I was like, you know, it seems like that market's pretty saturated. Maybe um, like some bridge building and some more coherent engagement would be <laughs> viable in this market. Your hipster, <laughs> hipster bitching? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like, I mean, it's not that fun to just like, I don't know everybody's so extreme now and they all think they're right. And I think I've just really chilled out now. It's just like, I don't know. Everybody's so certain that they're correct and so certain that everybody else is full of shit and it's not productive. So, you know, like at the end of the day, if like what you're doing is not generating an outcome or the outcome that it's generating is just conflict and chaos. It's like, what the fuck was the point? You know? So you, 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 you'd separate bitching from criticism. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, criticism, especially like if you have the capacity to engage, like I feel like I'm pretty good at the art of starting a fight and then finishing it by making friends. So, you know, I still, I think I use that tactic but it's not like in the old days when I would like really get angry and really just want to like tell someone something. And now it's just more like strategic and constructive. Like, let's see if we can kind of push this person to respond. And then if they respond, let's see if we can find common ground and communicate about what we do have in common rather than fixate on this one little thing that, that brought the discussion to light. So why do you want to connect? Why do you want to bridge? Why not just, um, just yell, just keep bitching? <laughs> well, you know, like for me, I think connecting people is more effective, especially, especially in the crypto space. I think that, you know, there are a lot of bad actors and those bad actors should be called out like with, with you know, just as much as possible. 
Um, but then there are people who are acting in good faith that, that sometimes that they're, they're not economically aligned with you or, um, you know, and it's like, or, or they're, they're, they don't think that they're aligned with you, but really they are. Um, we're all trying to solve the same problems. And I just don't think it makes sense to go to war with people who are operating in good faith because it turns people who are ostensibly trying to solve the same problems in the world and in, into not, it's not even like healthy competition. It's just, it, it, it creates this extra level of chaos and warfare that distracts from, from solving the ultimate goals. And so when you're trying to accomplish something like having these little turf war battles that distract you for extended periods of time is energy, time and resources that you could be, you know, either just, pushing wholeheartedly towards achieving your own individual goals, but also like, I don't, I mean, I don't know, just like, don't waste your fucking time if you're not going to be productive at the end of it. There's a question that I think people have a lot of trouble with. And that is how do you differentiate between the two? How do you listen to someone make an argument and make a judgment call on whether or not they're acting in good faith or they're, malicious or malintended in some way or like bad how do you how do you, how do you, how do you differentiate between bad actors and people who may be just ignorant or uh like naive or just operating under a different assumption or um you know i don't know i think i have a pretty good intuitive grasp personally so that's not you know and, it, and it's definitely probably something that's been refined over um you know, a lifetime. I'm not, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's a huge part of why the conflict, the, con the, the internet has become like a really uh, conflict laden place um, because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to really suss out when, when somebody just has a disagreement or whether, whether there's a misunderstanding, but I guess I, I don't know. It's like, if you, it, I guess it's this, like if somebody's not prepared to engage you, um, when you, dr when you draw down and you say, Hey, listen, like, let's chat. Like if they just keep going at it or I don't know, sometimes it's obviously that it's obvious that people are scammers or that they're full of shit just because of the way that they talk and the way that they're operating. But most, most of the time people that are operating in good faith, if you, if you just keep the conversation at a certain level, they'll, they'll recognize that they're in the wrong and they'll bring it back. Like, um, it, it, that's, that's pretty much how it goes. If you like walk up to somebody and you're like, Hey, you know, that's bullshit. And then they come at you and you're like, listen, it's just a little bit of a disagreement. And they're like, no, fuck you. Like, you know, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> All right. I don't know. Know. How do you, don't, how do you, the second part is like, how do you identify that they have, like you have common problems you're trying to tackle? Um, I mean, you know, in the space, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. People usually lay out what, what it is they're trying to do. And again, maybe it's just a lot of me having really detailed models um, in my head of the, of the problem scope. And so it's really easy for me to, to kind of see, even if they don't see where they fit in, if I see where they fit in, then, then I'll really go out of my way to try to engage them in a way that, that gives us an opportunity to, to find that common ground. Like it's, it's really like a lot of sales, you know, it's like, and a lot of personal connection. Right. So I think, you know, like, like the web five people, you know, they came out really hot and everything that they were doing was to kind of attack something I don't think they understood fundamentally. But for me, I, I see their criticisms and I see what they're, how they're, they're, they're assessing the problem space. And it's things that I personally think that, that, that crypto does miss. Like you don't need every single problem, um, you don't need every every decentralized application to live on a blockchain and there are a huge number of applications that make no sense on a blockchain and are not functionally um scalable. deployable on a yeah they're not deployable on a blockchain they're not scalable on a blockchain and and it's just like 
it's a huge blind spot because I think people that get into crypto kind of get obsessive about it and, and they, they get, they get sometimes people that are into technology are just like into technology and they get obsessed with the tech, you know? And, and for me, I've always been obsessed with technology as a, a means to solve problems. And so to me, it's always going back to the fundamental problems that we're trying to solve rather than, you know, pumping this particular technology. Like, I don't really care what tool I use as long as the tool is effective at achieving the goals that, that we set out to achieve. And so if another blockchain comes out with a good idea, I, I don't get upset and, and like, call call it bullshit like it's a good idea okay now if the people running the blockchain happen to be pieces of shit i can still also say well they're pieces of shit but that doesn't make their idea any dumber like like look at the idea the idea is still good and and in the context of the the web five people what they're doing with the centralized identity um is something really important um you know being able to have a decentralized identity that in which you hold your data and in which it's executed in such a way that it can't necessarily be exploited to become some dystopian future um, is, is, is a really important problem. Um, creating an infrastructure in which web applications can be distributed, or not web applications, but P2P applications can be distributed or servers for different things or protocols can be deployed in a way that um, makes sense is really important. Now, the one thing that they're missing is why crypto is important and what use cases it is appropriate for. And so at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether or not they see that, you know, because they're solving important problems and I'm happy to have conversations with them, even if they're completely adversarial, because at the end of the day, if I can guide that conversation with them in a way where I see it and I can provide feedback and they can listen, then when we get to the point where it, they're deploying and and these things are, are something that anybody can use because it's open source, then we can just deploy them within the context of, of what we're trying to build or we can deploy what we're trying to build in the context of what they're building depending on the, the, the architecture. Um, so yeah, like it's 100% like, true, but I, I, find, I find it interesting that we have, like despite everyone saying the same words in one way or shape or form, and having similar motivations, we have so much infighting with this like bag holder mentality. And in the process of having that infighting, we may end up with like incompatible APIs across these technologies. So like, if you wanted to deploy something that they have, it may be difficult because we never had those early discussions on yeah, yeah. how to be compatible in the first place. And it's, it's why I think, um, reaching out as early on and, and being a person who's approachable and authentic and like that they can trust, whether that be web five or whether that be anybody you know, I, I, that's, that's extremely important. You know, um, it's extremely important to be a person who says what they're going to do and does what they say they're going to do and is not acting in bad faith at any, at any point. People need to be able to trust you in order for them to listen to you. And, you know, whether or not people, you know, really appreciate my personality on Twitter, which is to a large degree a persona, it's not the full articulation of myself by any means. Um, Twitter. It's fucking Twitter. <laughs> it's fucking Twitter, you know, and a lot of people like have refused to engage with me because they mistake my Twitter persona for who I am. And so navigating that has been something I've been doing recently as I'm trying to build more bridges. I, I don't want to seem like an unreasonable person. I want, I want them to understand like this is a persona and the person behind that persona is actually a lot more complex and um, really cares a lot about solving these problems. Um, so Can I just interject and just say, I don't know who you are on Twitter because I don't really use Twitter. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people don't know who I am on Twitter. Um, okay. I, yeah, give us, give us, let's, let's just back up. Let's just back yeah. up. Give us the background yeah. of who you are and how you came to be where you are today. Yeah. Well, my Twitter handle is I am texture. Um, I mean, it really depends on how far you want to go back. It, I could, you know, have a six what hour long you, conversation. What are you trying to personify on that Twitter account? Like, what are you signal boosting to attract? Um, I mean, at, at first it was just like, 
I'm on Twitter. It's crypto Twitter. Like, I want to say things I want to say. I want to shit post and have fun and communicate with people. And then, you know, for, it, for a time, it was very difficult to have kind of deeper discussions um, because my following didn't really respond to it. They just like stuff like Ethereum is the best and Cardano is shit or whatever. And then if I would have like a detailed philosophical rant or like uh, technical, you know, like they just didn't care. So luckily, like in the last few months, um, you know, I've got a, I've gotten a, a, lot, a lot larger of following um, and they've been a lot more engaged in that. So it lets me express more of that. But um, I didn't have a large following because I didn't want to necessarily be a public figure. Um, and now I've kind of shifted and I kind of feel more of a responsibility to be one. But to go back to, to the previous question, um, you know, uh, I go by texture. Um, I was one of the, the, the founding members of Ethereum. Um, I was there day one. Uh, I kind of came to it in a very strange way. It's, uh, I was not interested in Bitcoin at all. I had a roommate who bothered me about it every day when it was like less than a dollar. And I kind of, I had been in technology for my whole life. I started coding when I was very young. Um, and, you know, I built like uh, an application, which was basically MySpace six years before MySpace launched. When that launched, I was like, oh, I'm like the world's foremost expert in this. I should like, <laughs> I should go I like, this. yeah, I should go work on this. So I found, uh, you know, I, I just started searching through like, articles um and, and trying to find people doing something I, I thought was interesting that led to me moving to palo alto to work with uh, a company there it was a little bit ahead of its time it didn't really work out but then i just kept kind of grinding through that um so he had pitched me bitcoin and i and, and i had kind of like fancied myself more of like a modern day like revolutionary like i wanted to change the world and i wanted to change the world in very specific ways for the better and I was really spending majority of my time trying to figure out, figure out how to do that, right? How do you really instantiate massive change in the world, in the modern age? And to me, Bitcoin was just like nerd money distributed by lottery. I didn't care. I didn't care about money. I came from a very like leftist liberal, like, I don't give a fuck about money. Like that shit's stupid, whatever, you know? Um, people who are rich are like, pieces of shit because they should like invest <laughs> you know what i mean it's like yes it was like a very uh, uh in retrospect uninformed position on the nature of value money and how to affect the world so you know i ignored it um for i ignored bitcoin for a very long time until it hit you know t like 1200 dollars or whatever it was the, the first time and then i was like well you know i don't care but i'm not so stupid that i can't tell that other people care and so I started, you know, looking into it. Um, and sorry for any noise I'm in the hotel room. Uh, so, he, you know, finally, I, 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 he convinced me to listen to a podcast. Uh, and I just kind of still thought Bitcoin was stupid, but I just kind of had a vision. Which podcast? Let's Talk Bitcoin, probably? Yeah, it was Let's Talk Bitcoin. Andreas, yeah. Yeah, so it was Andreas and Adam. and so the way that i you know the way that it happened from there um was as soon as i kind of saw the future i i i just knew that i wanted to be a part of it and i needed to talk to people in the space and so i thought uh if anybody wanted to get attention they would clearly talk to to adam um and so the the guy who convinced me to listen to the podcast just happened to come out of town I, you know, I told him, Hey, you know, I listen to the podcast. I have a lot of ideas. I need to meet Adam. And he just, he was like, why, why do you need mm -hmm. to meet Adam? And I, I said, because I just, I need to tell him what I'm thinking about. I need to find other people who are thinking about it and I want to talk to them. And so he said he was flying out a few days later. And I said, and he was going to meet him in Washington. I said, no, no, fuck that. I, I'm driving you get in my car. So we drove from Oakland, California to some random ass like spa in Washington state where he was celebrating his birthday or something with his wife. And with just, Adam? Yeah, Adam. <laughs> and, 
and I just kind of barged in. I don't even know if they had their business meeting, honestly, um, even though his whole team had flown out. And I just kind of cornered Adam and I said, listen, I'm thinking about this. The, this is what I think this technology could be used for. Can you please tell me anybody who's thinking of this? And he said, listen, maybe five people in the world are thinking about this. One of them is a kid named Vitalik. Do you know who he is? I said, no, I'm not. I'm not in crypto at all. I have no idea who anyone is. Just like, you know, let me, you know, whatever. And he said, all right, well, I'll introduce, I'll introduce you to him if you want. He, he sent me this white paper this week. I have read it. So I read it and I was like, oh, it's not really the full vision that I had, but it's like close <laughs> enough. It's and enough it seems, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it seems like kind of like fate, you know, I was, I was really kind of like hippy dippy at that time. Um, and I just kind of like, you know, felt like it was kind of this thing that happened where the universe kind of put me in a place at a time and gave me a thought and put me in a position to, you know, meet these people. And so, uh, I said, yeah, intro me to Vitalik. And then we, uh, all started this Skype group and that's, that was kind of the genesis of Ethereum, uh, was that Skype group that, that grew from that, you know. The, oh man, that's, a, that's a hell of a, it's a hell of a, like a serendipitous connection of people to get you to this. You said that it wasn't quite your vision. What was your, what did you want to use this stuff for? Um, so like when I say vision, I mean, I think there's the abstract notion where like someone's like, I have a vision, yeah. you know, and this doesn't really make sense, but it, it was like a biblical vision, like like just this fully formed like 4d object beamed into my head it sounds insane and at the time it felt insane but it was so deep it was literally like a machine i could see the machine i could see it transforming the way that humans um interacted and i could just kind of see the the earth and the everything transforming and it, it was it was a very visual it was a vision you know mm -hmm. and you know, obviously a white paper is like a technical, like a, somewhat of a technical document. It's not that, it's not a, it's not, not that. that, it's not that, <laughs> it's just not that. So, I mean, it's not like I had particular use cases or anything, you know, that popped into my head at that time. It was just literally like a structural object that I could see the way that, it, that this technology could, could, change the way that human beings interact, the way that we encode value, the way that that value is, is utilized and spread. And, um, you know, I think as Ethereum has evolved, we've moved uh, further away from what that, that kind of initial seed was and closer and closer to that vision, while also um, a bunch of stupid things that, that weren't, you know, kind of in, mm -hmm. we've, you know, we've moved a little away from the original ideals of Ethereum, I'd say. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you have a vision, whether it be like some sort of crazy uh, visual thing that pops into your head or whether that be, um, you know, something you can articulate with words. And, you know, one of the, one of the problems I think with smart people is that when smart people envision how their tool, like how a tool is going to be used, they kind of imagine that everyone in the world is smart and kind of like them and maybe thinks like them. And then what happens is you, hand, you know, you're like, I invented this new object. It's for like cutting meat. It's called a knife. And then you hand it to someone and then they're like, Oh, I poked my eye out. And then some, someone else like stabs someone and you're like, Oh shit. Um, <laughs> I was really trying to solve this one problem and uh, it turns out uh, it's created all these other problems now. And so I think there's always unintended consequences um, of, of the introduction of a new technology. Um, I would say that the biggest surprise to me is how stupid everything is the first iteration. Like when ICOs came out, I was just, I mean, you can go through my Twitter history. I was just like screaming at everyone. Like, because the idea was we can make a better version of, a, version of an IPO 
or we can make a better version of a corporation in which it you don't have to pay an attorney to like you know tens of thousands of dollars to to manage stock and like what you, you think that you don't think well what's <laughs> up dude what up, nerds? <laughs> Alan has joined the chat. <laughs> One second. Let me finish my thought, and then I'll shit on you. Okay. Um, so what you don't imagine is, like, people go, okay, well, IPOs are not legal for us to implement, probably for X, Y, and Z reason. Let's call them ICOs, and let's just do a dumber version. You know what I mean? Or, like, you know, oh, blockchain will let people own digital own things digitally like you can put your house on a blockchain or you can own your car through the blockchain you can easily transfer it you don't think people are gonna make pictures of cats and sell them to other people and turn it into a weird casino like you just don't there's just no way you can know what people are gonna do but in retrospect i assume that people are just gonna do the dumbest possible thing they can with whatever you give them as quickly as possible and then you just hope that over time uh it, the, the the dumb use cases kind of peter out and the good use cases rise to the top. I mean, that's that's what you hope. Yeah. I mean, like with the proliferation of ICOs, the, the early ones, there's like a good portion of the like maybe first 10 are still around and trying to, I mean, they're, they're basically like venture firms at this point, allocating capital to make the ecosystem better. Yeah. And, but like, after those, you had this massive proliferation because they saw the overwhelming success of the first 10 with a bunch of dumb ideas because it was so easy. Free to money, bitches. And, and, and then, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's Colin, by the way. Colin Couché has joined the chat. What up? Lifetime friend of the podcast. Yep. <laughs> I messaged him and I said, hey, piece of shit, we're doing a podcast. Get on it. Did you? I did the same thing oh, in the nice return. That's <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean that's I think I think that's what happened. But to me, it wasn't even just the mechanism, it was the the scale of the raises. Right. So like I have this belief that if you can't do it with three million dollars, you can't do it with thirty million dollars. And if you can't do it with three million dollars, you also can't do it with three hundred million dollars. And if you can't do it with $3 million, you also cannot do it with a billion dollars. And I think there's an inverse relationship between the amount of money that a, that a uh, company or organization raises pre-product and their likelihood of success. Like, it's something I've seen for, I mean, I've been in tech, I moved to, uh, so 15 years ago, I moved to Silicon Valley. And you could you could pretty much tell when a company was going to fail because they got a hundred and fifty million dollar investment pre product, and what happens is instead of building a, a core or a foundation to a house, you're like motherfucker, we have infinite money. Let's build rockets and a castle and like fly into the <laughs> sky. Agree. And so then, let me ask you this question: How do you rein that in? How do you how do you 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 have a group of people who are very talented and they have this notion that there's limitless financial resources. How do you shift it to tell them, Hey guys, you actually probably should treat that as limited, even though it's. You unlimited. guys are thinking about it weird. So this be clear. Here. <laughs> they are trying to pump you. Like when people give you advice to the VC are like, Hey, hire as many people as you possibly can get as many devs as you possibly can because it raises your valuation. Every developer you add, it adds at least a million dollars to your valuation, like a really good developer. You know what I mean? So like they're trying to raise your valuation. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to pump you. So why are they trying to pump you? So they could, value at the end. So they could dump you. Yep. So like that's the whole purpose of this conversation that you're having with VCs. So you can't rein it in. So the, the VCs yeah, are literally like, telling you that's what they happening. want. And in order for them to fund you, they're going to give you this stupid money so they could pump you. So that they could dump you. That was not the yeah. mechanism, but that, that was not necessarily the mechanism during the proliferation of ICOs, ICOs. and NFTs. Ex there kind of was though. No, because like, every like, single like, I work in status, it's, right? I, I'm yeah. I'm clearly aware of this. Like <laughs> you got a tremendous amount of money with basically no tie to anyone telling us how to use it, other than we need to deliver the white paper. Right. And it was a lot more money than it was necessary to deliver the white paper. Yep. And what, it what the problem was is you had this irrational exuberance and hype of what the technology was going to offer. 
in people trying to do something and then getting a lot more money than they expected. If you look at the the Gnosis ICO, it, had, it was finished in like five seconds or 15 seconds, maybe two blocks. And it crippled the network in the process of doing it. It's because no one knew what to do with their already made gains from Ethereum. And there's nothing else you could do other than these early projects. And then people saw that and they're like, so, I guess that's so much these things are worth. Narrative-driven bullshit is just what the, the whole fucking ecosystem is built on. Narrative-driven so, bullshit. And so, so you think, were a good narrative, so they drove your bullshit up and you made a lot of money off of that, which allowed you to fund your research company, which you have now. But that's kind of the point is that they were just trying to raise the valuation. It doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't mean if you're hiring devs or if it, they're just trying to raise your valuation so that they can dump on you that's the whole purpose people yeah. just want to make money and colin colin was i think responding specifically to what i was referring to in in my time in silicon valley but you know it's it's human nature right and so the way the reason that the vcs behave that way and the reason that retail behaves that way is because it's just human nature to want to throw money at a thing and then figure out a way to make the money that you threw at it m worth more. And so you want to do that as fast as possible by default. Um, if you don't understand how value is created and sustained, um, and everybody, everybody, when they come in, in the beginning wants that now VCs are a little bit, well, I mean, <laughs> Uh, a they little made a business bit. out of this. <laughs> yeah, they made a business out of it, so they're a little bit more methodical. But you know, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of it's just a bunch of fancy. It's just it's just people in suits trying to make themselves seem more important than they are, um, while still just you know doing the same thing that is the the human nature thing that even the dumbest person is going to do. Now, a good VC though should have a network and should have the capacity to introduce you to people who can provide guidance because it's not that everyone's full of shit. There are people who, who know specific, very valuable things in a domain. And if you can get those people on your board, if you can get those people in your network in any way, they're going to provide a huge amount of value because like, that's just a fact. Like when I first got into your line with their vision. So that's the thing about, allocation of capital and money by these people like people use like once you get to a certain level of wealth which i think a few of you understand you, you get past your like threshold of needs yeah and you can you, you have a foreseeable future of like funding yourself and you have a bunch of extra money how you think about that money drastically changes and it's usually how do i ch how do i make change in the world using this as a as a proxy for human work yeah and I mean, and I think that's what VCs yeah, ahead, are doing, but they also yeah. bring resources into the, into the, into the picture to help facilitate people with ideas, get those ideas done, assuming it's in line with their vision. Fuck yeah. Them. I just want a big old pile of meth. <laughs> you could have had that. <laughs> so that, that's the thing though. The V and VC One giant stands crystal. for, <laughs> you can, you can do it, dude. I, mean, I know. I've you're from the, the South. Right you know, from the, you're, yeah, you're from the South. I'm from the South. We know who to call. Um, but, but the, the V, the V and VC. I have no idea who to call. Just go on a record. I, I don't either, but I'm sure I could call a guy who could call a guy. There you uh, go. <laughs> it says, it says for venture, not vision. And so, I mean, they might have a vision, but that doesn't make them a visionary. And visionary. No, they have a, they have a, they have a, like a, a directive, a mission statement of why the VC firm exists and how they allocate capital. And if they're. If they're wrong, they're not going to be around very long. No, but so. they all have one and they all have to make specific bets and differentiate themselves. They can't just all do the same damn thing. And and I think the, the biggest issue there is like when I first got to Palo Alto, you know, you're you're the reason that you send a bunch of money to like a 20 something isn't because they know what the fuck they're doing. You do it because they're willing to throw their body <laughs> at it and like die for it. Yeah. Whereas, you know, somebody who's in their 30s or 40s, they're going to be a lot more methodical. They got bills to pay. They're traumatized. They're not they're not going to sacrifice. Right. Like we Never were heard idiots. it said that way. We were, <laughs> idiots. we were idiots. You know what I mean? We just thought, oh, we can go and we know how to write code and we can build a company like building a company is so, so much harder than building tech. Like I could write. You know, I wrote so much code for thing for things that never came to light because, the you know, it doesn't matter if you have all the code. If you don't know how to turn it into a business, 
it's dead in the fucking water. So, you know, ideally what you have is people who can execute code and then they meet the people that have the money that can tell them how to run a business. And that's not always how it happens. But now, now I'm, I'm basically a, a, a monster who knows almost everything about anything that I ever want to do. But I'm also a traumatized piece of shit who doesn't have like necessarily <laughs> the energy and time to like throw myself into these things. And so the way that I see it is I have a vision. I have ideas. And when I see a team that is doing that, all I have to do is reach out to them and determine whether or not they can execute that vision. And now I'm just execute. making, yeah, now I'm getting to get this thing done without having to do all the bullshit work and they can traumatize themselves making it happen. And then, you know, it's like, good luck. Are you happy with that if you don't get a return on it? I most no. of the stuff that I <laughs> most, no, that's a dumb <laughs> question, Corey. You're supposed to get a Same. fucking return. There, I'm just saying, there's, help them get there's a, a balance the between. Here's the thing, like they don't just give you money. Like you're not like Anthony's not just going to give these people money. He's going to make sure he does everything in his power that, that money shows a return. It's not oh. just about the money. It's also about what can I do to help you get a return on my investment. Yeah, and 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 the thing is too, I, you know, if I deploy capital like you're my bitch like i'm i'm you're not I, we supposed do not, to say that out loud man <laughs> we don't have we don't have a friendly relationship anymore you know what i mean now Damn. if i no, that's help that's you, that should be the relationship yeah because here's the thing you we just discussed this your value to me is the fact that you think you can do it and you're willing to go and throw yourself into the fire and try to survive my job is to make sure that you survive right D despite the fact you're a dipshit in a lot of ways and so i try to align myself not so much as an investor I, because i do want to see people succeed and i don't mind investing in things but i generally invest in things where they have their shit together uh because i don't like putting myself in an adversarial position with these people where i have to like basically control them or be um, aggressive or manipulative. What I would rather do is align myself in a way that I can provide guidance and provide value to them and where it doesn't really matter to me if I get money out of it, right? Because at the end of the day, I just want to see my vision instantiated in the world. And that's more important than money because like you said, I have money. And did I lose a lot of money over the last six months? Yes. Is it more money than I can comprehend? Yes. Am I still okay? Yeah, I'm still okay. I'm still going to make my bills. It's not the end of the fucking world. But at the end of my life, I don't give a fuck how much money I've made. The, the money is kind of a scorecard. It's more important to me that I've helped people um, who, whose vision I think is, is good and right and valuable and made sure that they've done it. So I, I, I don't ever like approach a team and say, Hey, I like you. Here's the amount of money you're going to have to pay me. I say, Hey, I like you. <laughs> I like what you're doing. What can I do to help? And then I just do it. And then if, if there's a way for me to figure out how to extract value out of that relationship in a way that's, that's um, beneficial to both of us, I will. A lot of times like to go back to how can you tell if somebody is a good actor? Once I help somebody, um, if they're a good actor, they'll go out of their way to reward you. So I don't have to negotiate up front. And, and it's really like a lot of people might hesitate to do that because if they're going to spend their time and energy and give their thoughts, they're going to want to get paid for that. But for me, I would rather you prove you're a piece of shit as quickly as possible so that I don't waste a second past what I should helping you. And I don't want to have a financial uh, uh, relationship with somebody who I don't want to help because they've shown themselves to be somebody that I don't care to see succeed. So you have right. a preemptive asshole meter before, before investing. Yeah. Just like, you know, it's like let people show you who they are before you have a financial relationship with them. And this, this is not advice, by the way, this is not advice on how to be a good investor. This is not advice on how to live your life or how to be successful. This is just what I do. This is how I fundamentally operate. And I'm not going to say it like it's the best way or. I mean, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll jump off that ledge. It's advice for me. You should understand what I'm you're throwing your money at. <laughs> yeah. And and there are a lot of ways to do that, right? And there are a lot of strategies. Like you could probably sit up and come up with a, a better a better strategy for it, but I just don't 
I don't have the time for it. I just focus on what I'm interested in. And when I'm not interested, I wander off. <laughs> it's like, it's pretty simple, you know, it's like, and that's, that's not, you know, that's not like I sat down and like read a book or like wrote a thesis. It's just how I function. Here's a question. I know Colin's answer to this uh, and he'll chime in on it. Uh, based on where you came into this industry and the story you told and where you stand today, how disillusioned are you to like what we set out to try and our ability to accomplish it now? So, oh, I mean, about the industry, how disillusioned am I? Yeah. Mm, less than I am generally disillusioned with humans in general. So you right? feel as though this 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 industry is, is, is still ethically trying in a direction you like. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the industry was bullshit when I got in it. Like the first the first Bitcoin conference I ever went to was the one where mm -hmm. we announced in Miami Ethereum. And I had I had like not re like I told you, I went from not being involved in the space at all to being part of Ethereum like like that. That's how I got into the industry. Um, Thanks, Adam. Dude, the, the the whole fucking conference was just people with, with such severe autism that they you can't talk to them and then sociopaths. That's it. It was just people with like, who like, that's it. It wasn't like there was some moral landscape. And I know that libertarian, like, I don't know who the fuck here is a libertarian or where you fall, but like in the beginning, it was just like all libertarians who had, in, in my opinion, insane perspectives on the world. And it wasn't like they could think they're like fighting for some moral good, but like, there's huge flaws in the, in the, in the worldview of people who are libertarian or anarcho capitalists or whatever. And that, that was the people that were there. So I don't see that we've fallen from grace. I think that I'm more driven by the, the fact that there's a, a larger, um, a larger pool of people with different personalities and with different goals and a lot more people who are down to earth and who see the world from different perspectives. Now, I used to kind of like believe most people are good and, you know, you just have to give them an opportunity to be good. And now I believe most people are kind of like opportunistic pieces of shit who are nice when it serves them. And it and when they're when it doesn't serve them to be that way, they behave a different way. And I'm not I'm not being cynical. It's just when you don't have anything to be exploited, when you don't have money or resources or power or fame or whatever, people just treat you like a normal person they just chat with you about bullshit and you can go have a beer and then the moment that you have power resources money whatever 99 percent of people will see you as a pile of money as a source of something to be extracted and that's just a fucking fact and you can't know that about the world like even people listening to me right now the only people who are probably like nodding their heads are people who either had that experience or just fundamentally fundamentally believed it because they're cynical and that doesn't mean that they were right because they're right. They just happen to be right. When you go through that experience where like the average person doesn't treat you like a person anymore, when you now are a source of value to be extracted, that's not inherently moral or good, right? And that's just a weird form of opportunity. It's just basically saying human beings are humans and humans are not inherently good. They're not inherently evil. Some people are more good than others and some people are more bad than others. Some people are more destructive than others and some people are more constructive than others. It's just that, that, that was my general disillusionment is I used to think like, I'm just fighting for the little guy and I'm going to like build the stuff and the world's going to get better because the people that are good will be able to come together and make good. Okay. No, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> people are going to be people and they're going to do what people do. And so, you know, as much as I wish that I would have sold all my ETH at the top, maybe now and just like wandered off to um, and bought a yacht and just retired or, or whatever. It's like the reason I'm still here, man, is I've seen what happened with social media. And as somebody who, like I said, I uh, the first piece of technology, the reason that I learned to program was because I had an idea that basically was MySpace years before MySpace existed. I feel kind of lucky that I did not create Facebook. I feel lucky that I didn't create Twitter because to me, those, those things are sources of such social chaos and they're, they're, they're such a moral burden. If you had created those things that like it, 
it, it, it's just not something I would have been proud to be a part of. And so the reason that I, that I wake up every day and that I try to build bridges and that I try to make connections and that I try to talk about the, the need for authenticity and honesty and, and being a person that, that does what they say they're going to do and says what they're going to do and calling out bad actors is because... <coughs> <Thankless>. <coughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, you got, don't forget where you came. You know, don't forget how you got where you are. Don't get bigger than your britches for sure. Yo, those uh, they respond. dissed you hard. Holy crap! They owe their entire career to like partially your work, and it's like, yeah. And I'm not here. I'm not here to talk shit. Other you than should totally the talk shit. <laughs> I have no idea what, what this is about. Uh, oh, it's an agent of chaos. chaos. I'll, I'll, talk, <laughs> I'll, talk, I'll, talk, I'll talk about it in a second, but um, no, you won't. Pussy. Yeah, eye. no, I, I will. Uh, <laughs> No, I'll go hard. Um, <laughs> I just have severe ADD, so if I was trying to like finish a thought, I just—I mean, I don't care if we if we move on. But um, oh, the reason that I'm here is because I want to see the space fucking move in the direction that I think it needs to go. And and if I have to become a more public figure, like I said, I didn't want to be public for a long time. Um, if I have to become a more public figure, if I have to call people out, if I have to build a media empire, whatever I have to do, if I have to invest, if I have to, whatever structures I have to create. Um, and whatever sacrifices I have to make personally to make sure that I know at the end of this, that even if it doesn't turn out the way that I want it, I at least fucking did something other than extract value that I can sleep at night. Sounds and that's like why I'm still here. Screwing your body at the whole thing. Sounds like you're still screwing your body at the whole thing. Like a- alongside like. Oh, he's not throwing his body stuff. anymore. He's throwing his money at it now. It's very different. Well, I, no, he's going he's <laughs> to do, do both. He's got money to throw at it too. Well, you know, I'm going to try to keep it fun at least. Um, yeah. But, you know, what he brought up was bankless. And so, like, David Hoffman is a person who, um, when he came into the space, he he was obviously nobody, right? He was trying to, like, he was, I thought it was his idea, but when we had a Twitter exchange, he said it wasn't. Um, they were basically trying to, like, put real estate on the blockchain. And so, you know, he was on my timeline. He followed me. I, you know talked to him. I was very friendly, whatever. Um, and so uh, a few weeks ago, he followed my personal Instagram, which I don't, it's private. If I don't feel like I know you, if I don't feel like we have a connection, I'm not going to let you follow me. So he followed me. Um, I, I let him follow me. And then uh, because, you know, like now I'm on a podcast, I'm doing more kind of media stuff. I'm trying to get, you know, uh, a deeper kind of understanding of who I am and what I'm doing out into the world. And, and so I just said, Hey man, I'd love to come on Bankless." Um, and he said, <laughs> he said, he said, well, the thing is, um, we just don't think that would be very hot content. Um, and we're kind of views maximalists. And I'm, I just like screenshot it this. and posted it on Twitter. I and this. I just said, I said, dude, you know, when, and to this day, to this day, and, and as long as I have the capacity to do it, if you message me on Twitter and you ask for my time and attention and you have questions, and, and there are people who can attest to this, it doesn't matter who you are. I will respond to you um, like, and be kind to you and answer your questions, and I don't expect anything in return. <laughs> you did call him poor. Well, well, here's, here's, here's the thing about Colin. The way that Colin and I became friends is he was shit posting on something that I posted and he didn't have any idea who I was and he was calling me like a piece of shit or something and I just was uh-huh. like Google Yeah. Really? And I was like yeah. And I was like Google me mother and you, oh. you were like you were like, I don't know who you are. And I was like, Google me, you dumb motherfucker. What? And then you go yeah. And then call you a piece of shit. What the, what are you oh, talking about? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You didn't something to that say. extent. You didn't say the you didn't say the word piece of shit, but anytime anybody uh, I don't even know what context you're talking about. I could have been just fucking. <laughs> I have no. No, idea. but that's the thing. You didn't know who I was. We were shit talking, and I said Google me, and then you, later you came back, like, and you're like, okay, I know who you are now. But the point the point being is, I think like these up. these people. <laughs> I'll find receipts on Twitter, and I will. Well, I'm going screen. all the way back was, to the DM was history, bro, right I was, now, No, right not on DMs, now. bro. Not on DMs. It was a tweet. You're gonna have to search between us. I'll do it later. I'll post receipts. Anyway, um, so the thing is, there's just a level of respect that that I think, like, if I give you respect and attention in the early stages of your career, and you happen to all of a sudden become hot shit, and you walk around like you're a bad motherfucker, okay, that's fine. 
but fuck you, right? <laughs> I will tell everybody, like, what a piece of shit you are because, like, we deserve good actors and we deserve hu- people who des- we deserve people who um, operate from a sense of goodness and uh, authenticity and uh, a, a desire to support the community and support the people who, who uh, came before them. And if we don't have that, then fuck those people. Let's replace them. It's the same shit as when these shitty protocols collapse. Like, fuck the shitty protocol. Fuck the shitty people. Get off of it. You know, be a good person. Respect the people that came before you. Be kind. Like, don't just think that because you've made it, like, you can be a piece of shit. Like, it doesn't matter how much money I make. That doesn't mean that that, that gives me the right to, to treat people subhuman. It doesn't matter how famous I get. It does not give me the right to forget people who supported me in the early stages of my career or who were kind to me, right? You just don't do that. Well, I found I found our first message, by the way, if you're curious. And it's, what it's, is it? It's me to you. I reached yeah. out to you. And I said, hey, not to be that coin shilling dickhead, but have you been following our project? Referring to Avalanche. <laughs> no, but that's messages. Because I think you were dunking on Avalanche. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Like, no. This is legit. I was in the anyway, I was right, listen, I was in the seed round for Avalanche. I had I had lunch with Gunn in mm. Palo Alto at a restaurant that no longer exists in like two thousand something. So I've always supported Avalanche and I still support them publicly. Me too. Yeah. Well, you also dunk on Avalanche more than me. I have that right. And by the way, I don't dunk on them. I encourage progress. No, but I'm the same way. He's critical. Like like the (laughs) the other day, you know, uh, I made a tweet, which is kind of a joke, but I was like, the real problem I have with like these Web5 people is if anybody's going to be critical of Ethereum and adversarial, it's going to be me, motherfucker. Don't try to come into the space and steal my job while shilling your project. Absolutely like, nobody could talk shit about Sekniki but me. Put it that yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> shut up. And I, think, and I think that that's valuable and probably why Colin and I get along is it uh, is because we both see the value in criticizing your community, right? For the I agree good. With that. And a lot of people just shill either their own project or they just say positive things all the time in public and they don't criticize and they don't point at the, the gaps. But like when you're creating a system and you want that system to become anti-fragile, you can either get attacked from the outside or you can have people who are in the inside making those critical uh, those critical comments and, and pushing towards what needs to happen. And hopefully they're heard and hopefully they can create that change. But, it, it, you know, it's come at a cost to me, not one that really matters, you know, like. Well, you're uh, not a views maximalist anymore. I'm not a views maximalist. Um, but I am launching my own podcast called Hot Content soon, so be on the lookout for that. Cool. <laughs> really? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I was, well, I mean, to some degree, the reason that I, I mean, like, again, the, the reason that I reached out to be on podcast was just to, 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 to practice talking and articulating my voice so that when I finally was doing it on my own, I had not, I wasn't fucking up my own podcast. I was ruining podcasts yeah. like this. Screw like ours. Screw ours for yeah. years. Perfect. Yeah. That's so, actually a really good method. Yeah, exactly. And so then people can be really surprised, like how much better I got on my own podcast. Um, uh, since we're wrapping up on an hour and you try to keep these things around that time period, like shill away. Like what is the point of the podcast? What's the beanie you're wearing? Why oh, should people so, follow you? So texture punks is what's on my beanie and texture punks was a joke. Um, so when <laughs> the punks, we were selling for like 100k last year. I thought it was really ridiculous because uh, you know I started off as an artist actually, and I just thought they were so ugly and just hard to look at. And I made, uh, I just said like, what would a like if I made one of these based on like what I aesthetically like, what what would it look like? Um, and I made one and I made it my PFP, and then somebody messaged me and was like. Hey, it was Zo- uh, Zoe. Uh, is her name? How? Where did you get that? I love it. And I said, Well, I made it to make fun of punks because they're ugly. It's not actually a project. And she said, Well, you make me one. I said, Well, it's not an NFT. It's j- it's literally just a PFP. And she said, I don't care. I want one. And then like thirty people asked for one, and I was like, All right, whatever. So I just kind of like made layers in Photoshop and added like made different attributes, and then 
it just got out of hand. People kept asking for them. And I was like, this cannot be my full-time job. You know, I'm going to have to just, I'm going to have to hire somebody. I'll just make it a project. Um, you know, like maybe do like a free mint and my followers who follow me and like it can, can, um, mint one. And then like on 419, I reached out to a buddy because I think somebody said something on Twitter about a discord. And I just messaged him and said, Hey, can you set up a discord? And the next day just happened to be 420 and like, no, no, like thought went into that. Um, and the discord launched and 4,000 people showed up in the first 12 hours. And then 8,000 people showed up the first week. And I immediately realized that the scope of the project had shifted considerably from this, like, because <laughs> we thought maybe like 100 to 500 people would show up and they would just be my followers who like hardcore liked the thing or liked me. And uh, it just, it, it, we've just had to rapidly adapt to the fact that it's now like going to be a larger product. I mean, maybe not. The market has eaten shit so much. Maybe it'll go back to that. Yeah, the NFT, the NFT like, bounty searchers market has probably dropped considerably. Well, you know, the thing the thing about it is um, I've told people since the beginning, I'm not selling you an NFT for speculation. This is not an investment. I, I'm selling you a I'm selling you a PFP, man. Uh, guess you what want everyone buy- else said about their NFTs. Yeah, well, yeah. that's like even if you're fine. true in that. No, yeah, one, yeah. like the fact that everyone says that it's like, oh, these are not, you know, like our, our token distribution is a governance token. It has no monetary value, except they all have monetary value. So like, so, like, so yeah. for me, I'm, I'm being straightforward. I do not give a fuck if the floor goes to zero. And if you buy it as a speculative investment I, and it goes to zero and you complain to me, I'm going to point you back to where I said, I don't care. And that's authentic. Like this is a picture. And I think the difference is this, <laughs> if you, it, if you kind of, create this mechanism by which there's rarity and you distribute random pictures to people then you're then you're automatically creating this kind of marketplace where people are going to like not necessarily like the one they got and they're going to want to switch it or sell it or whatever the, the the distinction with texture punks is you will be able to design the exact one that you want to look like you or whatever you want it to look like and so make one that you like and mint that one and if you someday decide you don't want it anymore feel free to sell it but the the mechanisms are not designed so that they will lend themselves to like marketplace speculation. And again, because of the nature of the technology, I can't stop that. But like from the depths of my heart, I don't care if the floor goes to zero. Are they I, scarce? If, are they scarce? Yeah. We're gonna do ten thousand of them. Um, just then the marketplace is set up. So if you do <laughs> infinite ones, then like, it depends yeah, on what the utility know, is. Scarce, but if, if, there's, if, there's, if, like, if there oh, is a well, utility, I can't mint any of those anymore. Yeah. Then it's so scarce. I mean, you know, the thing is, we're we're trying to roll with it and and turn it into something that, like I said, we're trying to leverage the moment and and really do stuff. So the idea of the podcast came out of it, um, and it doesn't mean that we're not going to do stuff with it. It just means that was never the intent. You know, the, the intent was never to sell a PFP. Yeah, there's to make a value on the utility, but the point of the token is not the value. I mean, that's sure. something that I've, I've been, I've been trying to change this narrative of, uh, like say, like I did a talk at F Denver around like screwing up social crypto. Cause what you're talking yeah. about is using these things for social reasons and, and like building communities and a lot of what I said, like a lot, one of the messages of that talk was, I would like it if we can change the narrative of, or like reason for someone opening up their wallet to say, what can I do with these things versus what can I sell these things for? Yeah. And like, and- there is value associated with doing something with them and that's fine, but it can't be the primary focus. Yeah. And you know, for me, the primary utility of this PFP uh, is to have a cool profile picture uh, and anything beyond that. Uh, you can facilitate in your own universe. Uh, now, what we did decide to do was we did decide to dedicate a percentage of the primary sale and um, 50% of all royalties uh, to Ethereum core development. So we've been in talks with... He gets paid. Yeah, well, the, the way that this happened is when Peter was... And did you say his name correctly? Because I can't. So if you did say Shlagi, it again. I don't know if I pronounced it Okay. Well, I'm not going to say it. Slavagy? 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 So Peter, Peter had I made a post. This. He had made a post about how the ETH core devs were underfunded and underappreciated. And so I, I like 
basically just went on a rampage at that point against the Ethereum Foundation. And we managed to raise in about 12 hours, $360,000, which we distributed half to Peter and half to Marius. Uh, then another name that I can't pronounce, Ben Lujerger. And, um, you know, I just thought, okay, well, cool. If we're selling texture punks, then we should dedicate a portion of the sales to that. And I didn't even really think about the royalty thing until someone brought it up because I, I didn't really calculate how much royalties could be. Um, but th that way, if the secondary market does emerge, then then 50% of those royalties in that market is going directly to, to the Ethereum developers. And so I don't mind if that market emerges because there is a social goods component to it. But I'm definitely not going to be like, I get messages from pump groups all the time. And, you know, I'm not, I'm definitely not responding to that shit. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to, like, I assume any project that pumps has some sort of pump mechanism behind it with social coordination and wash trading. And that stuff to me is like fundamentally immoral and not something that, that is good in the space and it creates more bad than good. So if a market does emerge just because we do such a good job of delivering value on top of this stupid joke, I don't have a problem with that. But it, if it doesn't go anywhere um, other than just being a fun, pretty picture and kind of, uh, you know, lets people feel like they're part of something, then that's fine with me too. I'll go um, that one, I'll go that one yeah. now. Yeah. If, if, so the, the mint is hopefully um, probably early July. Uh, and if you guys join the Texture Punks Discord, and that's Texture Punks, P U N X. Um, uh, another Discord. And, and the dis <laughs> I Dude, no, I hate I Discord. Texture Punks is the only Discord that I've ever really. Like you it made me it made me figure <laughs> it made me figure out how to use Discord because before that I was super allergic, um, and you know if you Bring guys join, I'll, I'll VIP you. Colin, are you VIP in in yeah. you are okay? Yeah, I'll VIP you guys, and that just means that um, you'll get first mint, um, and, and it's a fancy word for uh, beta tester. So you'll get to beta test the interface for generating the punks. And um, you know, give us feedback so that when we do the the official launch, it's not a shit show where it's broken. Your mom oh, this is, this hasn't yet like launched yet. I thought like, no. we already done something already. No, no, just I just pictures. Made, <laughs> just pictures I just made, some hats. No, I just made these hats because I was bored one day. Dude, I have <laughs> hats like, too for the thing I was doing. Yeah, just I was it. like, why not make some hats? Um, but yeah, that's it. So, you know, if you want a cool picture, um, and you think texture punks are cool, if you don't think they're cool, then go get a different cool picture. Colin, give me an invite because I can't find it. Okay. It's, uh, the, the discord link is in the bio of texture punks Twitter. Oh, okay. I just looked at yours. No. Mm -hmm. Texture punk. I don't know how this works. Where's the fucking share link thing? I'll find it later. No need to do it on air. Uh, all right, let's wrap it up. Uh, anything else? Any closing thoughts? Any anything else? Point someone somewhere other than Texture Punks Discord. Um, no, I'm sorry that the market's down, guys. I know that's hard. It's hard for me too. It's very sad. It'll be okay. I'm liquid. Uh, it'll be okay. okay. Auto plus. Um, you should have should have sold when it made it when it made a difference in your life. Yeah, no, it's all right. Just hang out, hang on there, guys. Uh, if you came here to get rich quick, then you just learned that that's not how this works, and that was a bad idea. But stick around for the tech and the community, and and ask not what you know crypto can do for your wallet, but what you can do for crypto, and maybe it'll work out in the future. So you know, just try to provide value and be good to each other. And um, I don't know, love y'all. Thanks for everything. Thanks for coming on the show, man. That was fun. Yeah, thanks for having us. Mm -hmm.